In Konya, a small town in Turkey, is the shrine of the Sufi mystic who, above all others, has come to represent the ideals of Sufism worldwide. He is Jalaluddin Rumi, or Mevlana, which means Our Lord. He was born in what is now Afghanistan, but made Konya his home in the mid-13th century. His shrine and tomb here attract pilgrims from all over the world. While remaining a sincere Muslim, Rumi emphasised that rituals and fasting were for the pious, but love was everywhere and was much the surest route to the divine. The fact that Rumi was the best-selling poet in America in the 1990s is an indication of his contemporary appeal. Rumi's message is timeless. I mean, he lived in the 13th century, but today, all around the world, his books are translated and spreading because he thinks about forgiveness, peace, and self-understanding, self-respect. And I think when you look what's going on today around the world, more than ever, it's very applicable for everyone. It doesn't matter what's your cultural background. Rumi has always been the most universal of Muslim thinkers. In all his writings, you have this idea that as God is located in the human heart, you don't need ritual to get to him, that he's as accessible to Christians and to Jews as he is to Muslims. Rumi's followers, the Mevlevi Sufis, spread to Istanbul and throughout the Ottoman Empire. They became better known around the world as the whirling dervishes. <laughs> Whirling rituals were intended to focus their minds on the God within. The whirling ritual of the whirling dervishes, we don't say it's a dance, it's a prayer. Everything is whirling in the world, from the smallest cell up to the galaxies of the universe. Everything is turning. Our whirling is to join to, the, to this universal prayer. is not difficult. Everybody can whirl. At the beginning, some get dizzy, but after one month, two months, suddenly you become comfortable. The music for this ritual, called the Sema, comes from Ottoman classical tradition. Most of the instrumental pieces and settings of Rumi's poetry were composed in the 18th and 19th centuries. The ceremony has now become rather formalized, but what set Rumi whirling was something much more every day. There's a story of Rumi walking through the metal workers' bazaar in Konya and being overwhelmed by the sound of the beating hammers. This is when it's said he first started whirling, carried away by the rhythm into an ecstatic dance. Come, but don't join us without your music, he writes. We have a celebration. Rise and beat the drums. We are drunk, but not from wine. This is the night of the summer, when we whirl to ecstasy. There is light now. There is light. There is light.
Music is a vital part of Rumi's philosophy. His most famous poem begins with the sound of the reed flute, the neigh. Listen to the neigh, he writes, how it laments its separation from the reed bed. It's a wonderful symbol for man's separation from God. Kutsi Ergene comes from a long line of Turkish neigh players. Thanks to Rumi, the neigh is nothing less than an allegory for mankind. When the reed flute is not played, so it's not, it doesn't have any spirit in it. Okay. So the human being is the same situation when there's not the inspiration of God. There is no any harmony, any melody in him. For well, Sufis, breath is actually a very important symbol, isn't it? It's a so, symbol of life. Symbol of the life, symbol of the spirit, with the, the symbol of the animation of the material. And that's why in Sufi ceremonies, with the whirling dervishes, right. the neigh becomes the breath who invokes the name of God. Sema ceremony is a way to reach ecstasy. It's four parts. First part means towards God. Second part, with God. And the third part, in God. This third part represents the ecstasy. The fourth part represents coming back. At the end, we try to understand our mission. The most important message of Rumi is unity. And he said, we have come to unite, not to divide. In 1925, as part of his programme to create a modern, Western-orientated secular state, the new Republican leader, Kemal Atatürk, banned the Sufi orders and closed their meeting halls, their tekes. This one, ironically by the Mevlana Gate of the old walls of Istanbul, was used as an orphanage and warehouse before falling into ruin. Others, like the Galata Teke in the centre of Istanbul, have become museums. As far as the Turkish state is concerned, the Mevlevi are little more than a museum culture to be exploited as a tourist attraction. What's happening at this Sufi Teke in Istanbul highlights the central paradox of modern Turkey's relationship with Sufism. On one hand, the state is very keen to promote whirling dervishes as a sort of folkloric dance activity. On the other hand, they still ban real Sufism as a religious force. Of course, the effect of the ban on Sufism has been to drive it underground. We've come tonight to a rather nondescript looking apartment block on the outskirts of town to see a Sufi Brotherhood meeting in a flat here. Uh, except that in this particular case it looks as if underground means nine storeys up and no lift. Although there are groups of Sufis like this one meeting all over Istanbul, it was surprisingly hard to find one that would agree to be filmed. No one's been arrested for one of these ceremonies for years, but there's still a nervousness in Turkey about openly being a Sufi. Not 
that much hidden now, because in the 1940s, 50s or 60s, it was underground because it was very dangerous. You could go in prison for six or seven months because you are doing a religious ceremony, which is forbidden. So it is still forbidden, but we know that it's tolerated now. Maybe some indication of the changing climate is the cult success in Turkey and across Europe and America of the club Sufi Mercan Dede. Mercan, the seemingly radical combination of electronic beats and Sufi philosophy, goes right back to Rumi. Rumi has a beautiful saying. He says that we are all cross-eyed people. We see everything separate. But then when you start to look rightly, nothing is really separated. Everything is one. And the essence of Sufism is unifying things, not really separate them. In my first gig, I remember, I just put this beautiful sound of an A with a really good underground techno beats and whole energy in the dance change. And I realized that the electronic music and the Sufi music, they just tell the same story. They're using different languages. There is this palpable stillness at the center of the whirling that exists that you can tap into and you feel as if you're in the eye of the hurricane. Everyone disappears and it feels easier to remain whirling than to stop. DJing, you look at the dance floor there are black people, white people, Jewish people, Muslim people, gay, straight, young, old, and it did not matter. In that one single space, you just realize that in the essence we are all the same. And that idea is exactly the essence of Sufism. It's unifying the people and not worrying about, you know, who we think we are. I consider myself just a student learning every single day. Like a little kid actually playing with the stones in the shore and there's this whole ocean, what we call Sufism. Sufism. 